Well, the Bush administration has had a couple of mild reversals as the federal courts have said that Bush just cannot simply hold American citizens indefinitely without trial. And this, of course, really disturbs Bush and his supporters because they have a war on terrorism to fight. And they can't do it with just the old antiquated methods of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And it is so strange, so eerily strange, to be hearing the Republicans giving all the arguments that the Democrats used to give and the Republicans used to criticize, that the Constitution was written in horse and buggy days and it wasn't designed for the kinds of problems we face today. And George Bush has got to have the right tools and he can't be restrained by the Constitution. Well, what does all this mean? Well, let's just suppose for a moment that you were let's say, working in India on some kind of a job there, on contract for somebody, and while you were there, you got kind of caught up in the Kashmir independence movement. Kashmir is a section of India that includes both Muslims and Hindus, and there is a secessionist movement there trying to remove Kashmir from India and make it an independent country. And there are good people on both sides of that battle, and you happen to get caught up because of the people you meet on the secessionist side. And at the particular time that you're there in India and you're involved with some of these things along with your work, some Indian terrorists commit a terrorist act in Australia, in downtown Sydney. They blow up a building and a bunch of people are killed. And so the Australian government goes into India and wages war, starts dropping bombs and firing missiles into India in order to retaliate for this terrible terrorist act that happened in Australia. And they start landing troops there, and they start rounding up people that are on the wrong side as they see it. And lo and behold, in all of this, this sweep of Indian rebels and terrorists and so on, they arrest you. They capture you, and they take you to Australia, and they put you in a special military prison. And you're held there without any charges lodged against you whatsoever. No bail. You have no right to an attorney. You have no hope of any kind of release because you are an enemy combatant. You are not subject to the civil liberties, to the rights that are accorded to people in civil cases, in normal criminal cases in Australia. And so you're held there indefinitely. You can't even see an attorney. And, of course, you also happen to hear that the president of Australia says that, or pardon me, the prime minister of Australia says that this particular war against the terrorists may go on for the rest of our lives, which means that you could be in this Australian military prison for the rest of your life. and You can't even communicate with your family. And in Australia, when any kind of a hue and cry is raised about this, about these prisoners that have been captured and are kept without trial, without any kind of civil rights whatsoever, the government says, well, it doesn't matter because you're a terrorist and the normal rules don't apply to terrorists. You're an enemy combatant. But in fact, you're not a terrorist. You're just someone who felt that Kashmir had a right to be independent of India. And everything everybody in Australia knows about you being a terrorist and all the terrible things that you supposedly did and believe and are trying to do and so forth are all things that have been told to the Australian people by the government. All they know is what the government says because no one has access to you. No reporter can interview you. No attorney can interview you and carry your message to the Australian people or back home to the people in America. No one can do anything on your behalf, and so everybody knows that you're a terrorist. Well, that's like one of these nightmare movies that happen where somebody's in some little western town and gets thrown in jail and they throw away the key or you're in a Turkish prison or whatever it is. But in fact, this is not a movie. This is real. This is what's happening in America today. This is what's going on at Guantanamo Bay where 400 people are being held without charge, without bail, without access to attorneys, without being able to communicate with their families. And the President of the United States has said that they are entitled to no civil liberties, no trial, no Bill of Rights, no nothing, because they're terrorists. And how do we know that they're terrorists? Well, because the government says so. The government investigated and figured out they're terrorists. Well, by that logic, we don't need to have any court trials of criminals in this country. All we have to do is to ask the prosecuting attorney, is this man guilty? Yes, he's guilty. Well, then, let's go ahead and put him in jail for life or execute him or whatever it might be, because all we need is the government's word or the word of a policeman or whatever it is. We don't need to have a trial. We don't need to bring other sides of the evidence out. And that's what's going on in America today. And Jose Padilla, for instance, as you've heard, has been in prison for a couple of years. And the court finally said that he either has to be charged in a civilian court rather than a military tribe court uh, or military prison. He either has to be charged in a civilian court with some kind of crime or the government has to let him go. And, of course, the Bush administration is fighting that. And President Bush says that these tribunals are very, very important. He goes out someplace and speaks to some crowd that's been organized uh, to cheer him on. And he says things like, as he did 
way back in 2001 and has continued to say, the United States is under attack. And at war, the president needs to have the capacity to protect the national security interests and the safety of the American people. He said ordinary trial procedures for suspected terrorists could compromise such secrets. What happens in, if, uh, Bush says, what happens if in the course of this war that we apprehend or capture an enemy and we want to bring him to justice? What if the information necessary to bring him to justice would compromise our capacity to keep America safe? Well, then, we've got to keep that information secret. We can't have an open trial. In a court of law, there would be all kinds of questions that might compromise our ability to gather incredibly important intelligence to prevent the next attack from happening to America. And Bush went on to say, it seems like to me that the president of the United States ought to have the option to protect the national security interests of the country and therefore protect America from further attack. And he has been supported in this by Democrats like Senator Schumer of New York and Professor Lawrence Tribe of uh, Harvard Law School, who's supposed to be a great liberal who fights these conservatives who are always trying to impose some kind of moral tyranny on the American people. Tribe said that he endorsed the overall idea of military tribunals, saying that they don't per se violate the Constitution and that such tribunals need not hew to all the rules of evidence that are followed, including the jot and tittle of the hearsay rule in courts martial. I think you'd have to be kind of pig-headed not to recognize that insisting on these ordinary rules, doing business as usual, would be too much. Oh, my. Shades of Adolf Hitler. Isn't that what Hitler said? Boy, we've got to do things for the national security of this country. We are in extraordinary times. We have to protect the state from these people who would bring it down, who started the fire at the Reichstag, and all of these other things. And, of course, the obvious answer to that is George Bush is no Hitler. What are you talking about? This is not Nazi Germany. Well, let me tell you something. In 1933, in 1934, in 1935, in 1936, Adolf Hitler was no Vladimir Lenin. And Nazi Germany was not the Soviet Union. But because nobody stopped Hitler and nobody stopped the Nazis, it eventually became the Soviet Union. And Adolf Hitler became as much of a tyrant and a dictator and a totalitarian ruler as Lenin and Stalin had been. You have to stop them at some point. They keep telling us that we should have stopped the Nazis at Germany. Well, it would have been nice if the Germans had stopped the Nazis in 1933. And it would be nice if we made sure that we stopped Bush in 2003 before he creates a system here that is completely alien to the American way of life. And before we go to the phone, just a couple of more points i like to make about this whole business. I gave the example of you getting caught up in the web of the Australian government. And the reason I use that particular metaphor or analogy was because David Hicks is an Australian who is stuck at Guantanamo, one of the 400 there. And he has been held by the American government. And he finally did, a couple of weeks ago, get an opportunity to see an attorney thanks to a ruling by a federal court. So my use of the uh, Australian government was not so far-fetched. One other point I'd like to make, in movies, we see lynch mobs, and we wonder how these lynch mobs can possibly act the way they do. How can people be so insensitive, so cruel, and so short-sighted as to just lynch somebody on the basis of somebody saying, he did it, he did it, I know he did it, without giving an opportunity for the person to defend himself and so on. And one of the interesting things about Western movies is that it is usually the fearless reporter, the fearless editor of the local newspaper that tries to stop the lynch mob, that usually is portrayed as the one person in the movie who's got a level head and a great sense of justice and fair play. And, of course, he's always the one fighting the rich rancher who's trying to starve everybody out by taking their water away from them or whatever it may be. But it's always the reporter who is trying to stop the lynch mob. But in the real world, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is the reporters that join in the lynch mentality and start screaming for blood. And I have always held it to be true that no one is ever as bad as the press makes him out to be, and no one is ever as good as the press makes him out to be. The press likes to either idolize somebody like John F. Kennedy or whomever, or they like to demonize somebody like Saddam Hussein or Michael Jackson or somebody else. Whatever it is, this person has got to be larger than life, according to the press. And so we need to be very, very careful about what we think we believe, because so much having to do with the war on terror, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and practically anything having to do with foreign policy, so much of what we read in the American press and see on the American television emanates from the United States government. It comes from officials who leak information to the press or speak to the press on condition of anonymity, and the press is merely a mouthpiece for the government. It's not owned by the government. It's not dictated to by the government. 
But these people love to get this inside information from inside the government. And it is a wonderful way for the government to be able to get its story out. And so before long, we all know that Jose Padilla was a terrorist. And it's very important that the Bush administration be able to keep him locked up. Bush once said in a speech, and I don't have it right in front of me on my desk, so I can't give you the date. But when there was some complaints from civil liberties groups about Padilla being locked up, he's an American citizen and he's being kept because he was suspected of having thought about building what they call a dirty bomb. He hadn't built a dirty bomb, he didn't have a dirty bomb, but he was suspected of thinking about building a dirty bomb, and he has been in prison in the United States for two long years. And for a long time, he had no access to an attorney, and finally was able to get to talk to an attorney. But a year or so ago, when some reporter asked about Padilla and said, isn't this a violation of his rights? Isn't this a violation of the Bill of Rights? Bush reassured the reporter. He said, you don't have to worry about this because Padilla is one of the bad guys. Meaning, I have already judged the case. I have already determined that he is not innocent. He is guilty. Therefore, he doesn't need an attorney. He doesn't need a trial. We don't need to bring the evidence out in court. We don't need to do anything else because I am satisfied that he is guilty. Well, that's just great. Whatever state you live in, you can just be assured that the governor of your state will decide who's innocent, who's guilty. We don't need trials anymore. Heavens, we don't even need George Bush. We've got people like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity who judge people at a distance. They're endowed with some kind of divine powers that give them the ability to figure out who's innocent and who's guilty. I don't know how many times in the little that I have seen of Bill O'Reilly, I have seen him make a remark like, oh, he's guilty of sin. Uh, oh, he's guilty. He's got, he deserves to get 20 years. They ought to lock that guy up and throw away the key. Well, there is a reason for presuming somebody is innocent until proven guilty, and that is because there is a reason for prosecutors wanting people to be guilty to pad their prosecution records. And now let's see what's going on out in the real world. First, we're going to go to that hick town of Franklin, Tennessee, and talk with Rod. Good <laughs> hey. evening, Rod. You know that I call yeah. this a hick town because any town that houses Harry Brown must be a hick town. Well, at least we'll have good company in our little hick town. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. Uh, actually, I love this area. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful area to, to have yourself and your family, that's for sure. Um, it's a good pleasure to talk to you again, Harry. We've met a couple of times uh, over the years. I worked for your campaign in 96 and 2000, and uh, uh, unfortunately we didn't do as good as we wanted. But uh, uh, Have your friends forgiven you yet? Oh, no, no, I'm sure they haven't, but uh, it was well worth it to me anyway. Um, we, uh, I, uh, I was uh, listening to your uh, comments about the uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Australia, and I think he's probably right. This is something that will go on for at least several more decades in, in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, Harry, uh, I've thought about this for quite some time. I wanted your comments on this. To, to borrow a phrase or paraphrase uh, Robert Bork, of all people, it seems to me that uh, this country is quite a, kind of uh, slouching toward Brazil, uh, Brazil, a country where the uh, the military takes over the government about every 15 to 20 years, uh, statistically anyway, mm -hmm. and, and and takes over and, and waits till someone comes along that suits their interest. Now, I'm not suggesting the military is going to take over the government anytime soon, but after seeing the fervor of the idea after 9/11, uh, it seems to me if we ever had another attack uh, along those lines again, uh, it's not out of the stretch of the imagination. But conversely, it seems to me if if the prime minister is is indeed correct, and this goes on ad infinitum. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we're becoming unfree from a different perspective, that we're chasing these ghosts all around the world forever and ever and spending all these trillions of dollars. Look at all the wasted potential of, of all the all the law, the Patriot Act laws, and all these various things that probably far more to come uh, down the road to, to be able to uh, go after these people and all the, the, the loss of the economy that's, that's almost assuredly to happen in the years to come. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Harry? Well, you're certainly right that a tremendous a quantity of resources are being poured into this, resources that could be put into elevating our standard of living. And I don't mean through new government programs, of course, but by just simply leaving the money in the hands of the people who earned it. And, of course, there will be no end to this. When I said the Australian prime minister said that this will go on throughout our lifetimes, of course, I was using that as an analogy because that's what President Bush has said, that this war is not going to be over in a few years, that this is going to go on. And the object of the war is not to simply conquer some other country like Iraq or Afghanistan and not simply to impose some kind of new government or regime regime change on some particular government, but according to Bush, it is to rid the world of evildoers, which means that it will go on forever, and it means that we have nothing to look forward to, to be able to say that there's going to be a VJ day like there was in 1945, a VT day when we have victory over terrorists. There will never be an end to it, because the very act of fighting the terrorists is being done in a way that is breeding more terrorism. Yes, As yes. so many people have pointed out, 
the war in Iraq has has been a tremendous recruiting tool for Al Qaeda because it just backs up what Al Qaeda has been saying, and that is that America is the bully that's trying to tell everybody around the world how they must live. And when you have a president that says you're either with us or against us, you're back to Nazi Germany again. And the Germans saying, look, you are either going to be on our side or we're going to conquer your country. And the next thing you know, they're ruling uh, most all of Europe, with the exception of Switzerland and Spain, and trying to take over Russia and bombing Britain and so forth. And th there's no end to this. And yeah. it doesn't make any sense at all. And, and I've said before, and I, I'll just keep saying it every week if necessary, with $2 trillion of our money, they could hire, they could hire the best minds in the world, people who could come up with solutions to these problems that don't involve caveman tactics of just taking a club and trying to beat people into submission, that there must be better ways of doing this that do not breed resentment, that do not lay the, the groundwork and the seeds for the next war, but rather can solve these problems without these thousands of year old techniques that have never produced lasting solutions, but they don't. They just simply go back to the caveman techniques and uh, attempt to beat the world into submission, and it simply is not going to work. And when somebody says, what would you do? All you have to say is, I don't know for sure, but if I had $2 trillion at my disposal, I can assure you I'd come up with a better solution than George Bush has. Yeah, and, and one more thing at long last, Harry. I've been a big fan of your, of your books for a long time, um, especially how I found freedom. I read back in the late 70s. It just uh, changed my life immensely. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, and from the handful of just very few uh, snippets of articles I read about that, uh, your, your new book that's uh, forthcoming, uh, I would have to say just... Uh, uh, thinking about it and, and uh, knowing your writing uh, and the timing of this, this would probably be the biggest book you've had in many, many years because uh, uh, at its best, I think the libertarian movement in, in general uh, tries to be the uh, uh, something of a compass for the country. And Lord knows we need it right now. <laughs> That's for sure. But I, look, I wish it were coming out tomorrow, but uh, I certainly look forward to it. Well, thank you, and I hope you're right about that. And, and what you said about the libertarian movement needing to be the compass, I think it's very important when people say, look, don't be too extreme. Don't make waves. Don't create problems. Say good things about the government, even as you're trying to improve the government and so forth. No, there no, has sure. to be somebody in the middle of all the hysteria and the lynch mob mentality, somebody even if he is going to be scorned, has to stand up and tell the truth and say this doesn't work and it's going to create problems. Somebody has to do that because there are going to be more people out there than we realize who are inclined to believe us if somebody would only stand up and say it because they can't themselves, themselves articulate it. So there has to be somebody to say it, and when uh, problems uh, arise from what the government does, there has to have been somebody who saw this coming and pointed out why it has to happen and why the next time we need to do this in a better way. So we must always stand up for the truth. And I don't ask you to lose your job, to lose your friends, to divorce your spouse over these things, but where you can conveniently and comfortably speak out on behalf of the truth, whether it has to do with a war or the size of government or the or civil liberties or whatever it may be, do so. You never know what kind of new friends you're going to make, and you never know but what you may touch the person who is far more powerful than you and someday may be able to change the world because he got a little impetus from you way back when just standing up and speaking the truth. Rod, thanks so Thank much for calling. Much, Let's go now to New Orleans and talk with Ann. Good evening, Ann. Hi, good evening. I'm glad I get to talk to you. Um, let me ask you a question uh, before about your show. Do you think you'll get more time on the air? Because um, two hours just isn't enough to cover everything that's going on. And I know you're busy, but do you think that you would ever have an expanded show? Well, that would depend on two things, I think, more than anything else. Number one would be the availability of the time from the network. And second, the ability to get sponsors to make it possible because the time costs money. Right. And we have been very, 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 very fortunate in having GlideRight sponsor these two hours and keep this show on the air. And I can't thank them enough for what Marjolis Berga, the president of the company, has done for the libertarian movement, not just in sponsoring this show, but over the last, oh, eight to ten years, he has funded a lot of things. And... I don't know that we could get other sponsors. From time to time, somebody has come on and sponsored the show, put ads on the show for a month or so, but it's not a big moneymaker for people who sponsor it. They have to largely be wanting to do it because they want the show on the air. So if anybody out there listening would like to be a part of making this happen, we might be able to get some more airtime. I could talk to the network and see if it's available, if somebody's there to sponsor it. And if you're interested, just write me at either question at harrybrown.org or just harrybrown at harrybrown.org, and I'll be glad to send you the details of what would be involved. Right, because you, you really should be on when the uh, hot air balloon comes on every day on all those syndicated stations. It's just it's just awful, like people like Limbar and uh, Hannity and and all these creeps are, you know, get three and four hours every day. And, you know, somebody like you, unfortunately, only gets a couple of hours when, you know, you have so much to say and this country is in just desperate needs of um, a lot of reforms and a lot of things and you just, you know, have it right on track. But anyway, I have a comment and a question. My comment, I am a registered libertarian for a few years now. 
And um, I was very, very upset. And I don't mean to put you on the spot with this. I was very upset when I heard that uh, Neil Bortz is going to be at the national convention. Mm -hmm. And um, I have listened a little bit to his show, unfortunately, because this station carries it and there's really nothing else on. And um, this man is no more a libertarian than Mickey Mouse, okay? It's, it's horrible. He is just horrible. And I feel that he is really undermining the good work you have done and the good work of other people in the Libertarian Party. And it, it has me very, very upset. I know, I don't, like I said, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't know what you can do about it. I do plan on sending the Libertarian Party, you know, my comments for the, the right person about this, but I wanted to discuss it with you because it's not just about boards to stand on the uh, Iraq situation. It's, it's about everything this man does. He has absolutely nothing to say. I have never really heard him talk about anything similar to what you've even talked about. Um, he constantly praises the Republicans, and he's constantly criticizing the Democrats. And um, the man will not talk about the system as a whole, as you do. He doesn't offer anything good at all. I think his show is a total joke. And I'm very disappointed that the Libertarian Party made such a selection. Now, if well, he it, would have it debate, debate you, that would be fine, you know, or you mm -hmm. know, someone else. I, I could live with that because I know y'all would eat his lunch, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> Thank you. But, but, but as a speaker, he doesn't represent me, and I've talked to other Libertarians in my area, and they feel the same way, and I kind of wanted your opinion. Well, I agree that the Libertarian Party National Convention, at which they select their presidential candidate, should be a showcase for libertarian ideas. And the speakers there, uh, it's not a time to bring together people of differing points of view from around the country, people who may be allied with us in some small way, but rather it's a time to present hard libertarian ideas that people can see that there is an alternative, that we don't have to live this way, that there is a better life available, a better way of handling the health care system than having the government do it, right. a better way of uh, bringing world peace than having the government clubbing people to death, a better way of living our lives than having the government run it, and this is what the, the party convention should be. As far as the debate is concerned, it's possible that's what's going to happen because a lot of people have suggested it, but Anne, I would definitely suggest that you write to the party and tell them what you think because they're going to have to listen if a lot of people like you are, are offering advice. Thanks so much for calling. Okay. Stay in touch with Thank us. Uh, before we go back to the phones, let's take some emails. We've had some interesting emails, and I so often don't get to them because we get caught up with all the phone calls. And there's an interesting one here from Danny in South Carolina. <laughs> the subject that he had on his email was, speaking of lynch mobs, and he said, did you have to notice the outrage at Howard Dean's suggestion last week that Osama bin Laden be given a fair trial? I like this anti-Dean quote from John Kerry, one of his primary op opponents. Quote, what kind of muddled thinking is it if you can't instantly say that in your heart you know that bin Laden is guilty? End quote. Danny goes on to say, if he were so confident that he were guilty, would it be that difficult to prove it at a trial? That's a very, very good point. If it's so obvious that somebody is guilty, then it must be very simple to prove it at trial. And the reason we have the trial when somebody is obviously guilty is because we don't want to have some kind of pre-screening process where it is decided whether somebody is obviously guilty enough that he doesn't need to stand trial. Everybody should get the trial. And those that are obviously guilty will be proven guilty at trial. And those where it is questionable, maybe we will find out there is much more to the story than what we read in the paper and what we heard. It is, uh, it is really amazing when you stop and think about it. What do we know about Osama bin Laden? The chances are he is a terrorist. The chances are he's got a fanatical view of the world. The chances are that just like George Bush, he believes that the way to bring peace is by bombing people. And I suppose that if he were to be tried, there would be sufficient evidence to convict him. But really, 99% of what we know about Osama, Osama bin Laden is material that has come from either the Bush or the Clinton administrations. And if that's what's going to determine whether he's guilty or innocent, then we might as well pack up the court system and send it away because all that's going to happen is the government's going to make these decisions for us. Eric writes to say 400 out of 250 million, that's the 400 people at Guantanamo, it's a thousand times less than the chance of getting killed in a car accident this year. I think these numbers are why there is so little or no opposition to these violations of human rights. People care more about football scores, which seem closer to home, than what our government does to those others. Well, that's a good point. It is very, very difficult to get people to be concerned about the rights of others. And that's why it's important, at least I have found it always important, to try to phrase these stories in the second person. Suppose this happened to you. That's why I started out by saying, suppose you were in India. Not suppose somebody was, but suppose you were. So that people can get a grasp, a feeling for what it might feel like to be caught up in such a nightmare. Eric also says, any comment on the Supreme Court decision recently that the campaign finance laws are constitutional? Were you involved in that lawsuit? I was involved at the outset. I was the, I guess, the primary plaintiff to sue the government over this, but I dropped out of the lawsuit when it was decided by the people who had engineered it that they were going to try to do it on less radical or extreme grounds than what I wanted. I wanted to see an end to all the campaign 
finance laws. I didn't want to just pick at the edges of it. And when they decided to go for a more moderate view on the thing, I just didn't think it was worth the time and trouble because there's so many things that I could be doing with my time. Danny again, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, says, I heard you mention Lou Rockwell. I'm also a frequent visitor of his site. I mentioned him a few weeks ago. Rockwell seems to be of the opinion that democracy in general is a failure and will never work regardless of how it is implemented. I was just curious to get your thoughts on this. Well, my thoughts are very simple. It is not democracy that doesn't work. It is government that doesn't work. It is the use of force to try to bring about lasting results that doesn't work. And so no system of government is going to work very well. A republic where you elect officers but have them severely limited is the best we can hope for, and I hope we get it back. Well, let us get back to the phones now and go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Harry Brown, why do you hate America so much? <laughs> you know I'm just kidding. But, sure. uh, what, I, what I hate is are the people who are trying to take America away from us and replace it with something more like an old world country where the government runs our lives and where the government expects us to sacrifice for the glory of the empire. Mr. Brown, I could not agree with you more. And I was just quoting you, quoting Tom Tamara, who wrote uh, oh, yes. uh, This Modern World. But, uh, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to tell you, is that the Libertarian Party of Pittsburgh had their uh, uh, Christmas party recently, and Gary Nolan came and spoke to us. And um, I presume everyone listening out there knows that he's seeking the Libertarian nomination for president. Uh, so I got to meet him. He's a really nice guy. He uh, gave a really good speech and answered some questions. Uh, I gave a few bucks to his campaign. And that night, I, you know, I might have told you I recently joined the local party here, and that night I also joined the state and national party. That's uh, good. And, um, and also, I've been reading a book recently that a friend lent me. I'm only partway through it, but it is unbelievably fascinating and brilliant. It's called, I think it's called For a New Liberty, The Libertarian Manifesto by Murray Rothbard. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, so he wrote that about 35, 40 years ago. It was updated a couple times, but he, I heard he's deceased now. Um, did yes. you know him? Yes, I did. Uh, a remarkable fellow, a very, very intelligent, uh, very prolific writer, very strong on history, but his profession was an economist. He was a professor of economics, and he was a student, a direct student of Ludwig von Mises, who is kind of the godfather of the Austrian free market school of economics. And Rothbard took what von Mises had taught and extended it further to the point of saying that the best government of all is the government that governs not at all, in the words of Henry David Thoreau. And uh, he wrote some very, very brilliant pieces, both historical and economic scholarship. And he is greatly missed. He died in early 1995. Well, so far, I think he is as brilliant a writer and thinker as you are. And, well, I wouldn't go overboard about it. <laughs> no, but I mean, the more articles I read by you and the more I listen to your show and the more I read books like his, uh, I think I'm getting more radicalized every day. And I know a lot of people use that like a bad word. But I'm now starting to understand, you know, I've called your show before and said, oh, I'm a libertarian, but I'm not an anarchist. Uh -huh. And I might still not quite be an anarchist yet because, like you, uh, I might think that until we find find a way to get rid of government altogether, there might be a couple of functions that we still need it for, like a necessary evil or something, and that arguing too much about how how much we want to shrink government down might be silly, you know, uh, because of how far we are from anarchy at this point. But um, but the more I read about these things, the more I, I can understand where the anarchists come from, uh, like why people despise government so much, even no matter how much government tries to pose a, as a benevolent protector and provider of services and things like this. And, I, I mean, but, well, they, I guess they call extreme libertarians anarcho-capitalists as opposed to the socialist anarchists that I get in these debates with, uh, you know, around, uh, around the campus. Yes, uh, Rothbard himself was the one who coined the expression anarcho-capitalist. And a couple of comments. First of all, there are many very, very good writers in the libertarian movement, which is very good for us, uh, some of them not still alive, like Henry Hazlitt or Frederick Bastiat or F.A. Harper, but there are still uh, many of them still alive, like Lou Rockwell, and his daily site has a number of good writers that contribute to his daily site at lourockwell.com, Lou being L-E-W, rockwell.com. And we are, as I say, blessed with having a number of good writers. And I think that there are more good writers coming along all the time. With regard to anarchy, I don't want anybody to be alarmed. Uh, you're making an important distinction. The anarcho-capitalists and the anarcho-socialists are two different kinds of people. The anarcho-capitalists were people who believe that private property is very, very important and should be sacrosanct and are opposed to government because government keeps taking property away from us and keeps intruding on our property. The socialists, on the other hand, felt that private property was the root of all evil and that by getting rid of the government, there would be nobody around to protect property anymore and the property would be available to everyone then. And this, of course, to me and perhaps to you, seems like a strange contradiction in terms. If property is available to everyone, well, then... You really do have anarchy because you're going to have people fighting over the property. Well, yeah, I mean, it would two be people totally... want to use the same property at the same time, and there's no way to distinguish between them because there's no owner. Well, yeah, I've told these these um, anarchists, and I don't know if they call them, I don't know if they all call themselves socialists, but these some of these pe these collectivist type people who don't believe in private property that I've argued with, I've told them that the um, 
I think that everybody's standard of living would be so low in the kind of society they're envisioning. Well, basically what I told them is that I think that these, so, like these collectivist type arrangements can work on a small scale, like a family, a kibbutz, a, a monastery or something, people who know and care about each other personally and trust each other. And even then, families can be very dysfunctional and, and, and fight and be violent anyway. But to expect everybody to care about everybody, whether you know them or not, and if you try to extend it out to a whole country or the whole world, and the idea that somebody living on another continent owns the lake that you live next to just as much as you do, I think that this is very silly. And I think that the problem with these collectivist ideas, I, I try to explain to these people, is it completely forgets or ignores or overlooks the fact that people are individuals, for one thing. And Right. We don't think as groups. We think as individuals, and we have individual desires, which may not be the same as our neighbors, and that's why there has to be a division of property whereby each thing is owned by somebody who rules over that, and you don't have to go on somebody else's property. You don't have to deal with somebody that you don't want to. And the people who are on the anarcho-capitalist side are not bomb throwers. They're not people who want disruption and chaos. What they want is an orderly society, and they believe that private property is the foundation of that. Rob, thanks so much for calling. Thank you, we, sir. we will be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Join us by calling 1-800-510-TALK. Before we continue, I'd like to follow up a bit on the last call from Rob and the question about anarchy and so on. It isn't important that we understand what the perfect society would be like or what a society without government would be like or how little government would be the ideal amount of government. We don't have to answer any of those questions. What we do need to know and understand is that government is not the answer to our problems. If there's a problem in the country, like too much spam, coming into your computer every day through the Internet, or too many telemarketers calling you, or too many abortions in this country, or too many thugs around the world who want to beat people up or blow up buildings. Whatever it is, the answer is not going to come from politicians trading votes in Washington and employing people with guns to provide the solution. When the government solves a problem, such as bringing peace to Iraq, it does it by killing a lot of innocent people. When the government supposedly solves a health care problem, it does it by putting a number of people out of business and making health care much more expensive than it was before for a lot of other people who can't afford it. It makes it impossible for some people to get health insurance because it has loaded up so many mandates on the health insurance companies telling them they must cover every conceivable kind of thing that anybody might want to put a claim in for. And so young people who supposedly need the health insurance can't afford to buy it because it has to be too expensive to cover so many things. When we talk about government solving a problem, we're talking about policemen with guns going out and enforcing the law by threatening people with fines and imprisonment. Force is not an abstract thing. Force is a real thing. The kind of force that the government employs is no different from the same kind of force that is so effective in holding up 7-Eleven stores. It is the same kind of force that muggers use on the street to take your wallet or your watch. It is the same kind of force that dictators use to conquer countries around the world. And all we're saying is that force is not the ideal way to deal with things. It is the way that people have been dealing with things for thousands of years, and it has never brought lasting solutions to anything. Everything that we treasure in life, whether it is our computers or music or the ability to have such freedom of mobility through automobiles or to be able to fly from one side of the country to the other or to listen to radio or watch television or any of these other things, all of these things were developed without force. They were developed by people simply acting on their own, and many people tried and failed. But from all of this came the products that we enjoy and treasure so much. The books that we read are produced without using force. The movies that we see, all of these things that we enjoy that really have meaning in our lives come without force. So somebody like Murray Rothbard, who calls himself, called himself an anarcho-capitalist and wanted to see an end to government entirely, was not somebody who was trying to destroy civilization. He was simply looking for a way to eliminate force completely, at least legalized force completely, from society. We'll never eliminate force entirely because we can't remake human nature. We can't rid the world of evil, as George Bush would put it. There will always be thugs, and there will always be people who would do us harm. But there may be far, far better ways of protecting ourselves from those people than by starting out by taking a gun and going around and holding up people, extracting money from them, taking away their civil liberties and saying, now with these resources, we will protect you, which is exactly what government does. So all we're saying is there have got to be better ways. I spend some of my free time of which I don't have an overabundance, but when I do, I try to raise some money for the American Liberty Foundation. And this past week, I talked to a man who had donated to the foundation before, and he said he didn't think he was going to donate again this year because he thought the foundation was too negative, and what he wanted to do was to support organizations that were emphasizing positive solutions to things. 
And he said that you're harping on government doesn't work and so forth. That's negative, and people don't want to hear that. And I said, well, what sort of positive solutions do you have in mind? He said, well, I'm supporting the school choice movement, for example. Well, if people do not understand that government is force, that government doesn't work, that power always expands, that whatever you turn over to the government becomes a political issue rather than an educational or financial or medical or security issue, then they will fall prey for one thing after another. And school choice is a good example of that. The idea that the government can distribute vouchers and that this is somehow going to improve our education system with one more government program, it just is simply not realistic. And that's why we do have to emphasize the positive but continue to harp on the fact that government doesn't work. And we will be back in just a couple of minutes. To finish up my thought, I believe we need to approach people with the positive by starting out pointing out how much better off they would be if they didn't have to pay income tax, if we ended the war on drugs, how much safer they would be if we repealed the gun laws to show people the benefits that come from getting government out of something. But the next step is to get across the point that government doesn't work and that it is not the answer to the problems because you can show people how much better off they would be by eliminating one particular government program, but most people do not generalize on their own. And as a result, they will fall prey to the next government program. And there are a lot of people who think that school vouchers are a step in the right direction towards better schools in this country when it's exactly the opposite. It is a step in the wrong direction. It is a step away from choice. It is going to facilitate the government takeover of private schools in this country the way the government has taken over private colleges in this country through Pell Grant, student loans, and GI Bill, and all the other ways that it has forced private colleges to act more like government colleges. And eventually, private schools will all become dependent upon government vouchers to survive, and so they will all submit to rules that will make them like government schools. And if we don't realize that government doesn't work and it's not the answer to our solutions, then it's very easy to fall prey to the idea that, wow, hey, here's an idea. This is the way we ought to do it instead of having whatever the Democrat program is or whatever it may be. Well, let's get back to the phones and talk now with Harvey in New Orleans. Good evening, Harvey. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Hi, I was enjoying the conversation, and I trust you had a nice holiday. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, there are uh, some, uh, two things. I'll just. Do you have an address that people who don't have email can write to you? Yes, I guess so. You could write to me here at the American Liberty Foundation, and I'll give that address <laughs> after the next break. I'll have to okay. look it up. I'll be glad to hear from anybody who has any thoughts on any subject at all. Okay. What's and, next, uh, okay. Uh, um, well, about, about, uh, about three months ago, you asked uh, if uh, anybody had a favorite. Uh, I had two things I wanted to talk about, but just as an afterthought, about three months ago, you had a uh, Yes, if we had any favorite uh, programs you would like the government to consider keeping up, uh, possibly the Department of Civil, Civilian Marksmanship. It's 100 years old this month, and I got some. Uh, I just got some material. I thought perhaps I could Xerox it and send you a copy of it. Maybe you'd like to put it in your files or what have you. Sure, but understand that whatever the, this program is, it's something that could certainly be organized without having the force of government behind it, and people who want to do it can do it. They don't need police to back them up on it. They don't need laws. They don't need fines and imprisonment to make it happen. <laughs> Well, no, it has nothing to do with funds and in prison. The, the uh, program, as I understand it, is run mostly by the National Rifle Association. And uh, what the, the government's part in, in it is uh, when we have our obsolescent uh, uh, rifles uh, and ammunition, uh, the uh, organized matches uh, and training programs that the NRA administers. Uh, so it's, it's a little more... And I would be happy as uh, I'd just be tickled pink to have the NRA do that and disassociate themselves from the government mm -hmm. in the process. So what else is on your mind tonight? Uh, the, the thing about you brought up at the very beginning uh, you're, uh, about uh, the administration's refusal to uh, uh, allow these guys that are sitting in there uh, to have uh, any representation by attorneys and in a sitting in Guantanamo. It, to me, there, there are two things on this. One is that if you send them back, I think their families are going to be very happy to see them, but I'm afraid that they're going to be very angry about this incarceration for three, what is it, going uh, for two years now, and going on three years, and, and, they're going to want, and uh, they're going to want revenge, and that revenge is going to be shooting at some of our guys that are there. The second thing is, that occurs to me those, I, is it seems to me they are legitimate prisoners of war and uh, and I guess you, the United States can say, well, we 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 didn't sign a Geneva Convention agreement with the uh, Mullah Omar's government or something like that. They're more, it seems to me, they're more of a militia. But I don't know why the government doesn't. Uh, uh, I can see that they could make a general statement. Look, we're going to hold these guys because we know if we send them back, they're just going to shoot at our guys. And well, I, especially I, after keeping them in prison. For yeah, two years. and I can see that uh, that. Um, uh, if you know the, they they have a legitimate uh, concern on, on that, and but the other thing is uh, I don't see why they just come out and say, hey, they're prisoners of war, and let them be represented by uh, in, in whatever they want to uh, charge them with, if, if anything. 
I mean, there should be legal uh, representation there under UCMJ. Isn't that the way it was done in Korea in World War II? Well, the prisoners in the other wars were kept in prison camps, and then at the end of the war they were returned to their home countries. But there is no end to this war. George George Bush has made it clear. So these people are lifers. Uh, They're there for life, and that's why they need representation. That's why we need to know for sure uh, that they really are guilty. And what is it that they're guilty of? They're guilty of defending their country. If the Afghanis came over here and and decided to impose another uh, regime on uh, on me, I would be shooting at them. You're absolutely. <laughs> right, Harvey. You have you have touched on the nub of the whole thing, that these people who are fighting for what they believe, the same way our soldiers are fighting for what they believe and what George Bush claims to believe. And you have hit the nail right on the head. And for this, we're going to keep them in jail for the rest of their lives. I think that is unjust. Yes, it I is. I personally do, and I think that some way this should be worked out. Maybe with their, uh, their parents can guarantee them or something, you know, that they... Uh, I don't know, some sort of non-combatant status or, or whatever. Uh, maybe we sure. can train these guys in medical... Uh, uh, you know, like a, like an army of medicine, uh, uh, medical corps, corpsman or something or something like that. Whatever. Something they could use, certainly use in a place like uh, Af- Afghanistan, where they fight amongst themselves. <laughs> yes, of <laughs> Quite course. A bit of that, so. Sure, Harvey. Thanks so much for thanks your for call. being on the air, Harvey. You bet. Let's go now to Sarasota and talk with Armin. Good evening, Armin. Hi. How are you? I'm just fine. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Hey, what can I say? You're a popular guy. <laughs> Don't I wish? What's up? Well. I uh, listened to your point of view on various things, and I guess, for a better word, your ideology or philosophy pertaining to, I guess you could say, regulation or deregulation in a truer sense. And on some things, I can say from my perspective that I sympathize with you and maybe somewhat agree with you, but then on others, knowing human nature and knowing the power of uh, wealth and uh Absolute power absolutely corrupts. We all know this historically. When you take it into the context of monopolies, corporate monopolies, I just can't philosophically believe that the solution to the abuses that they commit is, uh, you know, not proper regulation or more regulation, but just give them more power and less regulation is the philosophical answer to the abuses that they're committing upon the people in this country and in other countries now with the military all over the world. So, and you talk about the government here. And, you know, I'd like to really see a government first before I'd want to rule out that governments can never be run right and correct because I'd really rather see a government first, and I haven't really felt that I've seen one in my heart since I've been on this earth and I'm 50, and that's government of, by, and for the people, not by the special interests and by the insider wealthy cartels. But why should it be for the people when these people have the power to do whatever they want, and the very fact that they have that power is going to attract to those positions the worst elements of society, the people who don't want to earn your money, but rather want to just simply take your money, and the government's there to do it for them, so those are the kind of people that are going to wind up there. What you're well, saying see, is you, you, you trust Teddy Kennedy more than you do Bill Gates. No, 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 no. See, your preface and see, now, I don't want to criticize you, but, but you're contradicting yourself because you were mentioning something, you know, just recently, a little bit while back, talking to somebody about you know, the niceties of people and predisposed, uh, you know, perceptions of things. And so, you know, you can't sit there and be negative, like you said, you know, so conclusively and so, you know, broad-based and assume that, that there's just not enough decent people in the United States that don't want to be do the honorable thing and really serve the people of this country and not serve their own selfish interests, unlike a lot of politicians and people that are have been attracted in, his, historic, in our historic past. But we've had some really decent people that, that have been in power, maybe the minority in number, but not the rule, unfortunately, or the exception, I might say. And uh, too bad we haven't had a majority because, you know, I think that, you know, when you take these arguments all the way out, it's just human nature. I'm sorry, I wish it wasn't true, but, but a lot of people that gain a lot of power and a lot of wealth, and it's wealth in our system the way we know it that gives them the power in this capitalistic society, so therefore they become obsessive, compulsive, you know, disorder types, and, and they don't even know what they're worth, and they're the most unhappy malcontents on the face of the earth. Because well, they, but that, that's their problem, not ours. No, no, it, no it is our problem. When no, it's not, to, no, it's not, Harvey. They uh, make it our problem. And pardon it's me, Armin. They Armin, I'm sorry. When they create wars, when they run our debt the way they run our debt. But those they, are, but that's only because they have the power in government to do so. We don't need, well, we don't need to worry about the people in corporations but, because but if, they don't have that kind of power. Yes, they do. Let me tell you an instance right now, insurance companies. I had a medical problem, and we're in a hospital, and I had a heart attack, and my wife's called an insurance company, and they changed the terms of our policy. They never wrote us or notified us in writing. They never sent us anything. They never called us and talked to us verbally or anything. So I talked to some uh, very high-up lawyers in Washington, D.C., and let me tell you what money does. They're sitting there telling me that in 37 states they can put right into your insurance policy uh, lobbyists that work for the insurance companies that are actually you know, employed by the insurance companies. Sure. 
they're putting right in the insurance policies where you can't really see it or find it. They're so complex, you've got to be an attorney to understand them and read them anyway. And they're putting right in there, they're hiding in them, that the uh, terms of this policy are subject to change without notice. That's more or less giving them freelance Free reign, what, and you know what? Free uh, okay, I got, I got you, Armin. But oh, first, so, first, so. Of, first of all, you're talking about lobbyists. We're trying to work through government, and that's so. that's a, that's a problem. And we recognize that, and that's why we want to reduce government to the point where it can't well, create those kind of problems. The second thing is the, 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 the second thing, Armin, that we need to understand is that in the real world, there are millions of people out there who want to serve you, who want your money, who want to provide some kind of service. And when somebody mistreats you in the free market, there's always somebody else who's going to come up with a solution and say, I can uh, fix it so that you can't be mistreated anymore, and I can guarantee it, and I can back it up in some way. And well, if he can't back it up, then he doesn't get, doesn't get your business. Well, that's, it, because, the gov- month, that's because the government has no, passed no, laws. That you, you don't understand that it was Congress that made HMOs so powerful in the first place when they passed the HMO Act in 1973. Okay, Harry, Harry, yes. I need one other point. I gotta okay, stay with us. No, stay with us. I will. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity, and I just totally love your music. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. It's really great. But anyway, uh, so now I've got, according to all the insurance companies, we've been trying to find it. None of them want to touch us. Uh, I may have to go to a state thing if I can even get that, because now they're all saying for two years they don't want to touch me because i got a pre-existing condition. So the insurance company, uh, arbitrarily, I would say, from my perspective, uh, you know, selectively changed our terms unfairly, unjustly, and I would say illegally if we had any kind of law in this country. We'll see what happens. Okay. And, arm, and, arm. and I could have got another policy, but, but I want to say this real quickly. It's amazing when all states said they were going to pull out of Florida for casualty for homes, how quickly the federal government got together and lined up and made insurance catastrophic for homeowners, waterfront homeowners down here almost immediately to protect the rich. And, and here's my thing I want to take and then I'll end it. Your philosophy, if everybody was true and we were all from a baseline that was real similar economically and we all had similar talents and everything else, it would probably be a really good system in the fewer sense but that's not the case because there's always manipulation, and some people are, uh, you know, handicapped, and some aren't. Okay, we and got it. Real we... thing, but one thing with with the, with the government of and for and by the people versus private, you still have the vote. You can vote them out theoretically. And that's the way it should be to keep it cleaned up and keep it balanced. And the, we, theor- we theoretically, Armin. Private. Okay, thank you. Theoretically, Armin, and uh, we don't have time to deal with all that, but maybe I'll talk about it next week. I do want to get one last call in, and that's from Les in Phoenix. Les, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Gary. Sorry to push you right up to the end. Can you give me yeah, everything in about quick. one minute? Yeah, real quick. Uh, you know, we should we can have some fun during this election cycle that's coming up now, and it's always been said that. He who phrases the question wins the argument. Mm-hmm. And it's really true. So I'm, I'm trying to phrase my question, and maybe you can help me down the time. The question I'm asking, especially to those that are asking our votes, not that I'm going to do that maybe, but is how much force do you believe the government should use on the private citizens that are paying the bill to enforce the edict? Mm-hmm. Especially when they refer to something. I think, the gov- I think the government ought to do X, Y, or Z, whatever it is somebody says. Then you say, well, how much force should the government apply to make that happen? And then they're going to back up and say, we don't use force. And they say, well, no, no, it's not a question of what you use force. It's a question of how much force. Right. And, and you know, the thing is, is what you do to do that in a crowd is you're, you're educating the reporters, and, and you're not going to get many of them, of course. But if you can just tweak a brain cell in one of them sometime, you know, maybe they'll ask a pertinent. Have you ever asked, heard a, a reporter ask a pertinent question to a candidate? <laughs> well, they, the funny thing was they did it to me a great deal because I was not in the race as far as they were concerned. Right. I had no chance to win, so they didn't ask me much about my strategy mm-hmm. or anything else. They said, but how would you be able to do the following if the government didn't do it and so forth and so on? And we really did have a lot of good conversations in television and radio interviews because I wasn't a viable candidate, as they say. And so they dispensed with all the, the, the fluff and really did talk with me about the issues. That was what was nice about running for president, and that's what a libertarian candidate is there for, is to go out and acquaint people with a point of view that they never heard before. Yeah, and that's what's important. Why the questions are, are directed most, mostly to the reporters and into the audience to get them people to think. Right. And, and that's that's the way that I've done it. You know, because you know you're not going to turn reporters around. They they got mortgages and kids to pay for too. And oh, the sure. government also, just like the rest of us. Sure. And very and very entrenched viewpoints. Yeah. And that's that's why I try to phrase those questions like that. And um, and that's why I was just kind of trying to think. Maybe this is the thing libertarians should work on a little bit more. As we go to the public forums, I'm a registered Democrat. It doesn't mean anything. But I, I go to the union meetings and and I, I kind of wave these little red flags at them sometimes. And I, I tell them, you know, I'm a member of two organized crime families. I'm a registered Democrat. <laughs> I said, if I were Republican, I could say the same thing. True. And, and that's exactly what it is. But, you know, you do have to inject and keep a little bit of levity in this thing. And remember to phase, phase that, you know, the when are you going to stop beating your wife question. Absolutely. Les, that's it. I'm sorry. We're out of okay, time. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Les. I appreciate it. Call earlier next time. Next week, we'll talk about corporations, about regulation, and things of that sort. Thanks for staying with me. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week and good night.